Good evening, everyone, and welcome to the 7th Northern Ireland Sheep Programme WebEx event. Unfortunately, we are still unable to hold these events on farm due to the ongoing pandemic. My name is Graham Campbell, and I am the Senior Beef and Sheep Technologist uh, here at Caffrey, and I will be your chair for tonight. Please be aware uh, you may experience connectivity problems from time to time due to your broadband speed. The event is being recorded and the link will be made available and it will also be hosted on the Caffrey TV YouTube channel where you will also find the previous six recordings uh, from previous events. Further information uh, in relation to the programme can also be found on the Caffrey website and also on the IEFJ Northern Ireland Sheep Programme page. Tonight we have two presentations, after which we will have questions. Uh, please submit questions throughout the event. Uh, laptop users can do this uh, by using the Q&A icon at the bottom of your screen. Mobile phone users can also do this by uh, assessing the Q&A option via the three-dot icon, which appears when you tap your mobile screen device. Please select the All Panelists option when submitting your questions. We will try and answer as many of these as we can. Also, your feedback is very valuable to us. Uh, so at the end, there will be a short survey, uh, but I'll provide you with further details in relation to that towards the end. Firstly, I would like to welcome our first our, our five panel speakers. Uh, tonight, we have Senan White, Caffrey Beef and Sheep Advisor and the Northern Ireland Sheep Programme Manager. Secondly, we have Trevor Nixon from Balnalec and County Fermanagh. Trevor is one of the nine Northern Ireland Sheep Programme participants. Thirdly, we have Darren Carty. Darren is a livestock specialist with the Irish Farmers Journal and a project partner. Ruth Murr is a Caffrey Beef and Sheep Advisor. And finally, we have Professor Bob Hanna, Veterinary Research Officer, uh, AFP by Stormont. Unfortunately, Bob is unable to be with us this evening on the panel. He has uh, prepared a, a presentation. However, Bob's colleague Siobhan Corey is available, uh, who is also a veterinary research officer with AFBE, is available to answer any questions. In addition to this, we also have Hannah McNeilis from Caffrey, who is providing us with IT support during the event. As I said earlier, this is now the seventh WebEx event. Uh, the previous events have focused on grassland management, finishing lambs, breeding for performance, OPA and preparation for lambing. As I said earlier, recordings of all these events uh, are available on the CAFRI YouTube, YouTube channel page. During Senan's presentation with Trevor, please note that if you want to enlarge the screen display, you can do so by clicking the expand view or full screen icons found at the bottom right hand of your screen. Just a wee bit of background before I hand over to Senan on each of the speakers. Trevor Nixon is a lowland farmer. Uh, he is one of the nine, nine Northern Ireland Sheep Programme farmers and lives in Balnadlec in County Fermanagh. Trevor is going to provide us with a background to his sheep enterprise and will highlight some of the practices he undertakes in recording in relation to addressing warm resistance on his farm. Professor Bob Hanna, Veterinary Research Officer VESD, has prepared uh, a presentation on anthematic resistance in the Northern Ireland sheep, pro sheep flock. Siobhan is available tonight to answer questions in relation to this presentation. Ruth Murr is a Caffrey Beef and Sheep Advisor, and Ruth is going to provide an explanation on the FACPAC system, which is the Fecal Egg Counting Machine. And Ruth has prepared a demonstration video uh, just to let everybody see how this works. And finally, we have Darren Carty with us. Uh, Darren is also available at the end to answer any questions. So please do submit questions uh, throughout, and I will try and get as many of them answered as possible. OK, folks, thank you very much. At this stage, I'm now going to hand over to Senan and Trevor uh, to take further. Thank you. OK, Graham, thank you very much. And uh, welcome, everyone, and hope you are all well this evening. And uh, thanks uh, for everybody for logging on this evening. And I uh, hope you enjoy the next day or so um, and find it informative. Just to let you know, folks, it will be within the, the events tonight. We will have a PowerPoint presentation. Then I'll be switching to uh, videos, as uh, Graham has mentioned. Then we'll go back to the presentation and then back to another video. So just, just to bear with us, there'll be a wee bit of uh, switching about uh, throughout the program. But basically, as you know, uh, the Northern Sheep Program, we have uh, eight main focus areas, but the one we're uh, uh, focusing on tonight 
as flock health optimization. And obviously what we would be encouraging all farmers if you haven't already done so, and we've been saying it throughout the program, is uh, have a health plan. But the, the one that I just want to highlight tonight um, in the third uh, middle of the line there, anthemic resistance or warmer resistance, which unfortunately is becoming a major issue uh, or in, in northern Ireland sheep flocks. So basically what we're trying to do is show what's what's happening on, on, the, on the farm in this case. So basically without further ado, um, I welcome our Farmer for this evening, uh, Trevor Nixon. Well, we're a full-time family farm here with part-time help in Benalec, and we're running 150 Belclare Cross Suffolk ewes, uh, dairy heifer contract rearing enterprise also, on 80 acres of grassland, 32 hectares owned, and 58 hectares in Connacht here, in uh, several different parcels, and it's all in the SDA land. Uh, so this, Trevor, uh, just showing a map here to everyone. This is the uh, main part of the, and hopefully if I get a wee uh, laser pointer here, we'll see. So where the laser is now, Trevor, this is the home farm. This is your home house here. That's right, yes. Yeah. Uh, so that would be, that, that's obviously what the, what the yards is. And then this is what you call, we would call George's. This is the, your main sheep area, Trevor. Is that right? That's right. That's where the sheep area is there, and that's where the handling unit is. Oh, excellent. Okay, so just uh, so I say, Trevor, like it is. It's a it's a beautiful area you're in, and we're just looking down onto the onto the, the river here. So uh, this would be a this year has been good for you, Trevor, and regards regards grass growth, and um, you know wouldn't normally this be. Year, this year has been excellent. Has been excellent in Fermanagh. This weather suited us uh, very well, having the dry period because we would be running on heavy ground here. Yeah, and that's it. And uh, we've had excellent grass growth this year. That's excellent. That's excellent. So, say, Trevor, obviously, would love to be out on the farm, and I say it's a beautiful area to be in. Um, but maybe you could tell us a wee bit, a bit more about the farm, Trevor, your, especially your sheep flock there. Well, we're traditionally a uh, three-quarter Belclare flock. Originally, we were a Suffolk uh, Shevet, and then a number of years ago, we introduced the Belclare. Uh, we keep our own replacements, and we operate a closed flock. Uh, as I said, our own replacement lambs, and we would also uh, sell excess replacements, uh, which are from uh, uh, kept from multiples. We don't keep any from singles, and uh, all lambed indoors because they, we have the lambing facilities back here at the home farm, and it's uh, easier for labour. Good job. So I would say, Trevor, like with the Belcler instance, you prefer a few lambs, like you would have extra ones, Trevor. What do you what do you do with them? We have extra ones, unfortunately, way fruit and Amy, they help with the rearing of the extra lambs, which are reared on a shepherdess system. Okay. Uh, we only let out a yo with two lambs. Uh, you now we try to adopt onto singles. We do the wet adoption, and nine out of ten were successful with that. But uh, because of so many lambs, you can see there a picture of a yo with five lambs. Last year we had three of those with five, and indeed we had five with four lambs, so we had quite a few extra. Uh, so, as I said, my wife Ruth and daughter Amy, they reared them on the shepherdess, and uh, that worked very well. I would say, Trevor, like, that's something we'll be coming on later on with your figures and your benchmarking figures. Like, your lamb numbers isn't something you're worried about, Trevor, or something you're pushing for anyway. Uh, you, you have plenty of them, so it's uh, it's other aspects that we're maybe looking at. I would say to, to the right here, Trevor, that's, that's to be a typical in some of your crossbreds or the cross shows there as well with the Suffolk. That's your Belclare cross, and uh, we're going back to those down with the Suffolk, and you can see one there in the background, and uh, a, a Suffolk cross lamb as well. Uh, so that's what we're using to take the numbers back a little bit and uh, put more milk into the into the oil also. Excellent, excellent. Right, Trevor. Sorry, we'll, we'll for um, folks. As, as you remember, like uh, with all these uh, events with the program farmers, like was, I've sat down a couple of years ago, and it doesn't seem seems only uh, last week, but uh, with the with Trevor and with the other farmers to set out what things could we achieve over the, the lifetime of the program. So, said I would encourage any farmer to do this, or all farmers to do this uh, with with your own situation. So, Trevor, like just these are an example of some of the things Trevor we talked about. Um, you have the EID system. Um, you know, you know the other things. Obviously, look at grassland management to improve it, and obviously more efficient yields. So, how how you been getting on with them, Trevor? How maybe some things ahead of others, or how how's how's progress been going? Yeah, so. 
We are using the EID. Uh, previously, it was uh, we would have recorded the lambs as they were born, tagged them and recorded them, and using the paperwork. But the EID is a lot simpler for recording that, and then we can follow the, the them through and see how they're performing. Uh, on the on the grassland management, we're measuring grass, and uh, also using the electric fence to split it up into paddocks. So you can see a uh, picture of the paddocks there and back fencing also so we find we're growing more grass doing that and uh, we will continue to subdivide and uh, that includes adding in more drinkers to facilitating subdividing the fields yeah, yeah uh, so that's... On, on the other one then uh, breeding more efficient ewes uh, and that's why we have uh, we're using the uh, suffolk now with uh, ebv figures and uh, with using the EID reader, we can uh, weigh the lambs at 60 and 90 days and uh, decide which lambs which lambs perform the best and, and pick from those uh, for future replacements. Excellent, excellent. As I say, like knowledge is power, Trevor. And like you know, you have you had the EID reader, but you know, it's just really been you really got onto it. And yes, there's there's more you could do with it, but it definitely has made a big difference, Trevor, in the last short period of time. So that's that's very encouraging. Um, the next we better come on here, as with all farms, is the targets. And with this, this was from our benchmarking system. And to say all the BDG farmers are, you know, this is part of the part of the progress. Um, and I say I would encourage all farmers to do this and do it early. Uh, that are recording, do it early in the year. Um, and you know, because again, if there's any things that need to be changed, that when when you see the figures, you know, you want to do it as early as possible so that meaningful changes can be made. Um, so basically, Trevor, like I'll briefly go through like. The scanning and the and the weaning and the barn rate aren't really an issue, Trevor. You're you're happy enough with how the yews are performing, yes. uh, and if anything, you might be pulling them back a wee bit. You know, just uh, you don't want, you don't want any more than you have. But, uh, you have the extra labour with the extra yew la with the extra lambs. Uh, so if we can pull it back a little, we're we're, we're happy with that. Yeah, no. and the actual yew numbers, Trevor, uh, maybe increase a wee bit. We will. We'll bring them. We're hoping to keep on more yew lambs this year, Shannon. There are, there are. And uh, now, get, the, get the numbers up. Okay, okay. Well, the one thing I just want to, there's two things I just want to raise here, uh, just for, for clarification. Um, store lambs, Trevor, that's really the issue that uh, we're, we're kind of focusing on tonight. Um, last year and the, the previous year, like quite high percentage, Trevor, store lambs, and that's really, you weren't happy with that? No, that uh, that was our main issue on this farm that the lambs weren't performing as they should have been, and uh, we were sending sending off less uh, fat lambs over the last three to four years, or going as store lambs, yeah. and uh, that's what encouraged us to to uh, investigate what was happening. In. Yeah, exactly, exactly. So we'll come on to that later on. So we hope uh, to, we well, we hope to. We are improving that, you know. Yeah, that's excellent. That's excellent. Uh, I just, I'm going to briefly, the figures at the bottom now, you may wonder why there's 2019. Now, there was a change in Trevor's policy last year. And obviously, Trevor's mentioned that he has a uh, contract rear and heifers. Now, those numbers went up. Um, for that side of the business and the, the sheep numbers went down, but also in relation to uh, the, num the the issue that we had, there was quite a lot of store lambs and they were they were held over. Um, so the figures in, for 2020 um, were kind of skewed a bit, so they wouldn't be representative of what it is. The 2019 figures, not as good as you would like, Trevor, but they're probably a bit more representative of what kind of was happening for a few years. Um, but I think you'd be confident, Trevor, with yes. the targets that you, you could meet, so you could, you'd get those okay. Yes, uh, this year that that will be improving with what's happening at the moment. That's great. Yeah, that's all the percent. So uh, getting the performance, the lambs are performing better. So we would hope to get that figure up. Yeah, that's that's exactly what we want. So just to make clear for that there point, folks. What I'm going to show you now uh, is uh, just a wee uh, photograph here that we took. Um, and the reason I'm showing this is this is Trevor's handling facility, but I just want to, I'm going to let Trevor speak about it, but I just want to raise your, bring your attention to the lambs at the front. Um, you'll see there, uh, some are red on them, some are uh, blue on them, some are green on them. These are going to be um, 
highlighted again, folks, later on, uh, these are the lambs that we use for this on-farm trial that we're going to be talking about, um, as I said, trial in inverted commas, um, but I just wanted to raise them so you, you, you know what I'm talking about, the, the, the red, blue and green lambs, uh, what I mean. So, Abby Terry, tell us a wee bit about the Holland facility. Like it's, I suppose it's, it's, it's been a, a real asset to the farm. It has. This was purchased a number of years ago under the first farm improvement uh, grant scheme. And uh, it's been a, a, that uh, I can handle those yows uh, myself. Uh, with uh, now, if if I have somebody else, it's uh, a bonus when you're working at them. But you have less stress on the operator and less stress on the animals. Uh, and and it is very good. You can see on this end you have the two a drafting gate. And on the other end, then you have what you call a magic gate that, as you can see, it 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 goes round in a circle and guides the sheep into that race. So that yep. it works yep. very well for drafting or handling and dosing or whatever yep, actions you want to do with them. Yeah, exactly. We'll see. We'll see that in action in the wee video now, and it's coming up shortly. So, uh, so just else, Trevor. Obviously, like uh, a lot of people, uh, you know. We'll, uh, the, the environment goes hand in hand with production, and obviously you've been you're a member, or so you've joined the the EFS scheme as well, and that has also helped you from the environmental point of yes. view, but also it's helped you your your grazing system as well. Yes, we did about a thousand meters of fencing uh, beginning of this year, and uh, it it's working well, and it means that we can subdivide the fields. Your, well, you, when you're using in conjunction with using that fencing system, uh, along with keeping the the water cleaner. Yep. I was to say, like this is some of the the fields, Trevor, with the with the heifers here. Are the heifers coming after the sheep, Trevor, or do they do the mixed graze, or they generally coming after them? The heifers are the heifers are uh, the heifers are coming after the sheep. You can see in that slide there that the the the, the oats and lambs graze that. And uh, it was getting strong. We then let the heifers in, and in fact, the lower part of that field uh, was uh, mowed and, and uh, round bale for silage uh, after that uh, slide was taken. Excellent. So basically, uh, so this it works very well. Uh, you can see the, the electric fence there. Good, and it is as you say. You're get you're growing more grass, Trevor, and, and you're using it, which is the important thing. Um, yes. So, Bobby and Trevor, so we've kind of covered some of the, the first three ones there. We've said about the, the EID, obviously, and you're hopefully getting more out of it. Um, the grassland has improved. Um, yes, all this, nothing's going to change overnight, but it's getting better. Um, the ground has been sound sampled, and you'll be doing it again. But I just want to reiterate, because it is tonight, Trevor, the health plan, um, and maybe draw people's attention to it. Uh, we sat down with your vet, Noel Doyle, uh, a while ago and had a very Frank and open conversation, Trevor. Maybe you could tell us a wee bit what came, or the main things that came out of that. Yes, well, the health plan was uh, probably the number one thing in in, in the scheme here. Uh, that we found it uh, very advantageous. Uh, we had the vet out, and we went through the, the the problems we had, and it wasn't only with the the lack of thrive, but also lameness uh, and other issues, but uh, lameness and the lack of thrive would have been the two main things. And uh, we we discussed that and uh, he suggested doing the, uh, the the dung samples and seeing where we're at on, 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 on the, um, with the worms. Uh, and that, uh, through that then we discovered that the, the problems that we, that did exist on the farm here. Yeah. Uh, I suppose the, the lack of thrive, as I say, was the main the, the, the main problem, um, and uh, that certainly has uh, been very very beneficial. Yeah, but that was that's what brought you to it. Uh, I basically said, like, you know, the warmer basically Trevor that you were using for several years basically wasn't working. Would that be right? That's what that's what we discovered. Uh, we. Uh, Last year, we dosed the uh, lambs in the beginning of July, and uh, towards the end of July, then we were weighing them. I had lost weight, and it was through using the, the ED recording system we were able to discover this. Now, also to look at them, you knew the were the wool was dry on them, and that, uh, that there was a problem there. But certainly, the recording system proved what the problem and how big the problem was. 
And uh, along with then doing the dung samples and sending that off, and when we got the results back, uh, discovered that we needed to uh, to change that, uh, and we gave them a different dose and went in again and recorded that uh, that worked, and we've seen the improvement. And of course, this year, using that different dose this year, we can see the, the a vast improvement in how the lambs are doing. Excellent, excellent. Well, that, Trevor, is, is the crux of the night, and that's what we want to. We thought, well, basically, folks, what happened was that Trevor's, you know, Trevor's lambs haven't been doing for a while. He's been using a particular wrench um, through the, the animal health plan, through the program, um, and obviously with the vet. Uh, we looked at options, decided to go for a, a different second generation of that uh, drench. Uh, that worked. So basically we thought, right, we'll, we'll investigate this a wee bit further and then what is the real issue? So the real issue with Trevor in this particular case was warmer resistance. So I'm just going to explain briefly what, what we did here and then I'm going to show a wee short video. Um, basically, as I say, Trevor was using the first generation drench, clear drench. Um, second generation was the one that worked. The first generation had obviously had resistance. So what we're going to show here now, and I'm going to bring, we bring in my colleague, uh, Ruth Moore, um, who has, will be demonstrating the, the faecal egg count uh, machine, um, which, which we use with, with these ones here. So I'll be switching on to a wee video here, folks, now. So what I will say to you is, again, you may need to expand uh, your screen. Um, so at the bottom right uh, screen, there's wee buttons there to expand the screen. So just, just be aware of that to full view. So I'll be switching that over now, folks. Um, so what, what will happen here is it's just a, Four minute video, uh, a wee bit about the setting up. Uh, Ruth will, will speak through the faecal egg count and then I'll be coming back in on basically some of the basics that need to be done and also to help uh, push uh, any sort of resistance down the road, the practical things that, that we can do. So, and as I say, Trevor, there's his drafting gate up the front and you'll see the lambs we were talking about on the left hand side with the different colours. So, basically, Ruth will be coming in now uh, just basically to explain that we took a, a faecal dung sample, a mob sample from each of those three different lambs groups. Uh, earlier on, I'll have to thank Trevor for all the work, him and Jason here, for all the work they did with that. So um, I think Ruth uh, will be coming in now. So Ruth. Yes. Evening, everybody. So this is just to show you what um, the FAC Pack is. So it's an online diagnostics program, which allows us to, to link to the internet and actually process a, you know, a faecal egg count on farm and um, there's also veterinary practices that may have them available and some agri stores are now doing them as well and um, so first of all the most important thing is collecting the sample correctly you know so you want a fresh sample you don't want to be selecting a sample on appearance you just take random samples as long as they're fresh keep the sample in an airtight bag and if you're storing it for a day or two before it gets tested keep it in a fridge but i would speak to your vet or uh, advisor about um the proper way to take a sample because if it's not sampled correctly then we'll not be given back the correct information so the sample is then made into a slurry and it's um, poured into um, for the, the eggs to settle to the bottom. So that process takes about half an hour. We haven't done that, but it takes about half an hour for the slurry to separate and settle to the bottom um, of, of the container. So you can see my mobile phone set up there and in just in the foreground then is the um, is the software on the phone and then we have the, the actual where we put the sample through. So we flush out um, the sample now, we just pour it out and then we add some saline solution to it and that allows the eggs to float to the top. So as I'm doing that, so as you can see in the foreground, we have this micro eye. The micro eye is speaking to the phone, which is speaking to the internet. And um, we'll put a sample into that micro eye and um, it takes about 10 minutes to go through. There's a camera in there and it takes photographs of um, the sample. Um, we then submit the sample to the lab in England and it's um, the eggs are counted via a computer mostly. So the computer is learning itself the more it counts or else <coughs> it is um, also checked by, by lab analysis. So we're not counting the eggs ourselves. Um, so we're taking that bit of um, you know, issue out of it, there's somebody else counting it. So in theory, we can get a, a result back within 
sometimes within 15 minutes, anything up to two hours, you're getting a really quick result back. And some of the very, very larger flocks in England may purchase a kit like this to share between two or three farms um, because they can get a you know, result back so quickly. So there you can just see me putting the sample into the wee wells and um, then that well um, goes in to get the pictures taken. Now, currently we really only do worms in this. We don't do fluke or coccidiosis in, you know, so the veterinary worming that goes to maybe AFB labs might give you a more uh, detailed result, but this is a good start and we would use it within the BDGs as a technology demonstration to um, let the ant farmers understand what faecal egg kind actually is. And I think that's that's it just sliding through and speaking to the phone. Okay, Ruth, thank you very much. Folks, okay. just, uh, that's brilliant, Ruth. Just the other things, principles I wanted to show here is obviously the way in, knowing your weight of your lambs. Uh, this is Trevor's wand on the EID system, but basically weight your heaviest lambs. Other things, read the label, a uh, dose to what the label says um, with whatever particular product you're using. The other basics, folks, you know, uh, mix the drench up completely. Make sure it's in date, it's well stored, um, and it's you know that it's the right product for for what you're for what you're wanting to kill, um, and all the things like you know set your gun with whatever the instructions are. So uh, Trevor here is showing setting the, the dosing gun, but this is the most important one: calibrating your gun, checking that it is given what you think it's given, and do that every so often because that's where a lot of guns aren't uh, calibrated correctly. Um, and then you can be under dosing, which is another issue with resistance. And then finally, dosing uh, correctly over the over the back of the tongue. Folks, it's just a, a short wee video there, just to explain what uh, the background to um, what what we were doing. Um, so basically, folks, from from what we did with Trevor, um, this is something we're going to um, move out with the other program farmers. We decided to have a little say on farm trial for one of a better term with a uh, some of Trevor's lambs and I have to thank Trevor for the work that he put into a uh, bringing the lambs out for us on several occasions um just to let you know the, basically there's there's 12 lambs uh, as far as I remember in each group so we took a fecal egg count in the table you see fecal egg count FEC and the and the the words EPG which is eggs per gram on the 7th of July um, the, the levels are such, uh, 490 for the green, 1050 for the red, and 280 for the blue. Now, if you were dosing them blue lambs, or looking at them blue lambs, obviously we were talking about a 500 uh, or thereabouts uh, egg count before you would dose, but that's those all lambs were all together. We would just pull them out um, and separated them for the purpose of this. So it just shows you the variation within the lambs. That average there, but if they were all taking us a pill sample, would be something like 600 and some, so they would be at the stage for dosing. So basically, the three lamb grips uh, were split up. Um, the green grip got the white drench, the red grip got the yellow drench, and the blue grip got the clear drench, which is a moxidectin product, which is a second generation uh, warmer that uh, Trevor was using on the farm. So basically, we wanted to see is there other is the potential there for other the other drenches to be working on Trevor's farm? We know that the clear one was working, but we wanted to see is this here uh, any potential for that? So basically, uh, as what Ruth did there with the, the uh, fecal egg counts, so each of those products to test is a thing called a reduction test and the SCOPS principle that Bob will be mentioning later on. Uh, in order for a, a drench to be effectively working or considered to be effectively working, you want at least a 95% kill in the egg count. So to check that, you, you dose, uh, you wait the number of days depending on the drench, and then you uh, test again. So basically, the white drench requires a two-week uh, check, the yellow drench uh, seven to ten days, and then the clear drench is uh, 17 to 21 days for this particular product. So that is a, a European uh, protocol called Comar, um, where, which is, you know, it's it's a it's a resistance uh, protocol uh, for for uh, combating antibiotic resistance and worms and that. So basically. What happened here was after the seven days, the uh, red drench, sorry, the red lambs, which were the yellow drench, had a, had a count of 51. So that was over the 95%. The green lambs, which was the white drench, uh, after the two weeks, which was the period for it, there was no worms there. So it was working as well. And the blue drench, sorry, the blue lambs uh, with the moxidectin, 
uh, it was down to 13. Now that was after two weeks. I just want to reiterate that. To be true, we would have, should have really done that in another week, but it had worked at two weeks. So just for the for the sake of time, uh, we had done it then. But we were very confident that after three weeks, there'd be even less eggs. So basically, uh, from Trevor's a uh, good thing for Trevor's uh, system is that from what our little experiment, uh, the uh, all the, all the drenches were working. So that's uh, a very encouraging uh, thing. But I say. Just be careful and don't assume, you know, uh, obviously check with your vet to making sure everything is working. So that was our, our results from that there. So basically I'm going to bring Trevor back in again. Trevor, hopefully you can hear us okay. Yes. Good man. So basically Trevor, these are your arms here now. Um, this is probably one of the most important slides or important images from your point of view. Um, maybe you could tell us a wee bit about Trevor, what are the things this is more pleasing to you than you've had for, for, for a while? Yes, uh, you can see, and uh, I can see more so how these lambs are doing compared to what they were doing last year in the previous three or four years. And indeed, even yesterday, we were weighing again. We had pulled out lambs uh, 10 days ago, and with, we were, weighed yesterday, so we get four or five more going to the factory. And in fact, we had another 15 ready. Uh, went away with those this morning. And on weighing, we could see going through that the, the growth rates on those lambs were very good. Uh, the daily the daily uh, growth rate, again, to go back to the AD reader, was showing that up. Uh, so, yes, very pleased with how they're doing now, Senan. Um, having got the, the, dosing, uh, the dosing corrected. Yeah, excellent. Well, that's what it's all about, folks. Like you know, and that's one of the lessons I would say we're coming on to. To that be a bit soon, but that at the end of the day is the important things that Trevor is happy and he knows figures don't lie. And, the, and as Trevor, you've said there, the 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 growth rates has improved, and you've lambs ready that you never thought you would have ready before. And really, that's that's where we want to want to be, and encourage other farmers to check that out. So basically, Trevor, uh, this will give you a bit of rest. So. Lessons learned, Trevor. What things you going to be looking at for the for the future on the on the Nixon farm? Well, uh, more from grass improving soil fertility. Uh, we will be uh, soil sampling uh, the complete farm this winter, and uh, if we have uh, all the land has got lime here in the past three years, so we'll be checking that again if it needs more lime, and then whatever is appropriate fertilizer we'll be putting out. Uh, I suppose on the grass, we uh, have ploughed over four acres this year and just got the seed into that last week before the rain came. And uh, previous year, we got 18 acres reseeded, uh, so that should help with uh, the grass. Uh, rams, we have purchased a ram three years ago with Suffolk with EBV readings, and we're hoping to get a textile this year uh, again, hopefully we'll, we'll be able to purchase one with, with the EBVs. Uh, make uh, more use of the... Uh, go ahead, Senan. No, just, I was just going to ask you, Trevor, like, it is an issue we have with a lot of the farmers that mentioned in these webinars is getting rams with EBVs, but you've been lucky enough to get them. Or, and, but, and they've worked, Trevor. I think you've been more than happy with them. I am. I am, yes. Yes, uh, because I purchased him and I wanted what's a good maternal traits in, in, in the ram. Uh, obviously, crossing them back to the to the belt there across to get me uh, yo lambs, future yo lambs. It is important to have those figures. Yep. And uh, the EID system making more, more use of it. And I suppose we see now the importance of the continually weighing them and picking out if there is a problem that you pick it up quicker and are able to sort it out. Uh, sometimes with your eye, you're, you're looking at them and wondering how they're doing. Or, and uh, but the, the, the the, the reader on the way bridge, it uh, you know exactly what's happening, and you, you can you can monitor what's happening with it, uh, and then that leads on to the effectiveness of the warmer. Uh, we will continue to take dung samples to see how the warmers are working, and indeed to see if we do need to use a worm, which is a warmer, which is a, a important as well, okay. uh, and taking lambs to heavier weights uh, with less stores. Uh, and again, with, with getting the uh, dosing right and, and that worm burden away, uh, we will have more going away as uh, fat lambs to the factory. 
and even more important, not having to feed meal the last number of years. We would get them up to 38 to 40 kilos, but was getting that extra bit, a uh, few kilos on them to get them factory ready, and that was taking meal uh, to do that. And hopefully it'll take no meal for someone and, and a lot less if we do need to feed it. Excellent. And again, Trevor, like that's all coming back to the benchmark and come back to your bottom line, you know, being more efficient. And hopefully we'll find, like, as you say, it's something we need to keep an eye on, but hopefully we'll find a, a major part to uh, sort that jigsaw out and, you know, while I improve your bottom line and say that's what the benchmarking and the weighing and all those stumps come together. And uh, it's, it's good to hear. So. Right, Trevor, we'll let you have a bit of a rest here now, and uh, we'll just uh, we're going to turn over now to the presentation from uh, Professor Hanna. Thank you, Simon. So, uh, what is antimicrobial resistance? Well, if you dose your sheep with the manufacturer's recommended dosage of any antimitic drug, be it white drench, yellow drench, clear drench, and so on. And the gut worms in the sheep remain alive in the intestine and they continue to produce eggs, then it is quite likely that you have antimitic resistance in the worm population in your flock to that particular drug. Now this change, the development of antimitic resistance in the worms on your premises is a genetic change in the worms. And so antimitic resistance will be passed on to the next generations of worms through their eggs. Go to the next slide. That should be up there now, Bob. If subsequent generations of worms year by year are treated with the same class of antimitic drug, then more and more of the population will be selected to survive. And the proportion of resistant worms in the population of worms on your farm will continue to increase. There's very little evidence that antimitic resistance is ever lost in a population of worms. So as the time passes, the problem can only become greater on your farm. Eventually, the only solution may be uh, to restore sensitivity to a particular class of antimitic on your farm would be to depopulate the premises and leave the land without sheep for several years. This allows the worm eggs and larvae on the pasture to die off and then repopulate with sheep from a clean source. So, so why then is antimitic resistance important to farmers here in Northern Ireland? Well, fairly obviously, uh, if you're treating with a wormer to which the worms are resistant, those resistant worms remaining in your sheep after the dosing will continue to cause ill thrift and scar, uh, maybe with fecal pasting around the back end and uh, possibly later in the summer when the weather gets a bit warmer, fly strike coming in and uh, maggots getting down to the level of the skin causing quite a bit of damage there. Uh, the ill thrift will cause increased time for the lambs to reach market weight. And as a result of that, there's an increase in the feeding costs involved. When the lambs go to slaughter, the meat quality will be reduced because uh, with ill thrift, there will be a higher proportion of moisture in the meat and the meat may be downgraded. So there's loss due to downgraded product. Also, there will be uh, impaired immunity in the sheep uh, with a resultant increase in the likelihood of bacterial infections, say Clostridia or maybe even Salmonella coming in there. So in addition to these costs, there's the added costs of medication you're going to need for secondary infections, bacterial infections for fly strike and so on. There's the wasted expense on antimitic drugs which are no longer working for you. And these costs will only increase year by year as antimitic resistance builds up in the flock. So, so what is the particular risk of antimitic resistance here in our flocks in Northern Ireland? 
Well, at the Veterinary Science Division at AFB, we carried out some studies uh, together with Queen's University uh, between 2011 and 2017. We did field testing for antimicrobial resistance on selected farms across the province. And we also collected data from farmers using detailed questionnaires. Some of you may have actually seen these. Now, I would have to stress here, the figures that I'm going to give you are, are rather out of date now. And the current levels of antimicrobial resistance on our farms across the province will be significantly higher due to year on year progression of the evolution of antimicrobial resistance in our sheep flocks. Now, this table shows us the results of the survey that we carried out. Uh, against all the wor important classes of wormers, which our farmers use, the white drenches, the benzimidazoles, the yellow drenches, the clear drenches, uh, the avermectins as the first generation of clear drenches and the more advanced second generation of clear drenches, the moxidectin, there was resistance recorded against all of these classes. And the percentage of farms on, on which we find resistance for the different classes is shown in the third column there. I'd have to point out that for the yellow drenches, the levamazoles, there were only a few farmers in our survey were actually using them. So uh, the amount of, of resistance, percentage of farms showing where the worms showed resistance to levamazoles was rather low because there's so little use of that drug across the province. Uh, in contrast, the second generation of clear drenches, the moxidectins, are very widely used and very widely relied on by farmers across the, product, across the province. And therefore, correspondingly, there's a high level of uh, resistance uh, in the farms across the province. Uh, in the years that we did the survey, the orange drenches were only just being introduced. So at that stage, nobody or of the very few people that were using the orange drenches uh, had resistance recorded. But uh, the, le the level of resistance to the or orange drenches is likely to increase uh, as years go by. Now, what I've been talking about so far, having the gut worms that appear in sheep and lambs as they grow during the warmer summer months and into the autumn. But what about nematodirus? Now, nematodirus, as you probably know, is a parasitic worm which lambs acquire from the pasture just after weaning uh, in the springtime when they're, when they're turned out to grass for the first time. Climatic change we now know is altering the patterns of nematodirus infection in sheep across the province. And we're, we're actually starting to see increased levels of infection of nematodirus in sheep and lambs in, in the autumn and winter as well as the spring. However, uh, nemat nematodirus, the control of nematodirus is still uh, largely being carried out using the white drenches, the benzimidazole drenches. And against those, there is resistance. Uh, about two thirds of the farms in our survey uh, are still finding that the benzimidazoles are useful to them. But in about a third of the farms, there is resistance to benzimidazoles uh, amongst the nematodirus population. Uh, most alarmingly, the moxidexins, the second generation of the clear drenches, uh, there's quite a bit of resistance uh, with about 75% of our farms with uh, nematodirus resistance to moxidectin. And this simply reflects the fact that farmers are relying on the uh, first and second generation clear drenches uh, rather than using the benzimidazoles and therefore with the increased use of those uh, drenches, there's correspondingly more resistance developing to them. Uh, this is despite the fact that uh, nematodirus is not on the list uh, provided by the manufacturers of some of these branches. Uh, it's not on, on the, um, the list of worms that are affected by them. Uh, so farmers are choosing to use the clear branches, uh, although they would be off label use for nematodirus. Uh, so it's just a simple thing there, Bob, like, you know, 
as what we covered earlier on, like read the label. You know, it may or may not be covered, and in a lot of cases, unfortunately, it isn't. Yes, indeed. Uh, read the label is the take-home message there. Yep. Uh, and if limited iris is not on the label as as a target species for the drench, then it's better not to uh, make use of it. You're only wasting the drug and increasing the chance of development of antimentic resistance on your farm for that. Excellent, excellent. So how do we test for antimentic resistance on farms? This is done by uh, fecal egg counting. And the usual procedure which we recommend is that we, can, we ask farmers to submit to us pool dung samples before dosing with the drug which they want to test. The pre-dosing dung samples are collected uh, from the group of animals to be tested. And this can conveniently be done by allowing sheep to stand for uh, a wee while in a clean trailer and then sweeping up the, uh, the dung from the floor. Following the collection of the pre-dosing uh, pool dung sample, the sheep are dosed to the weight of each individual animal. And that, that's quite an important thing to weigh them individually. Uh, following the manufacturer's recommended dose rate and using product which is in date and using a dosing gun that has been checked for accuracy. Post-dose dung, post dung samples are then collected from the same 10, 10 animals at a time after dosing that is determined by the class of antimintic that was used to dose. The time interval between dosing the sheep and collecting the post-dose samples uh, would depend on the class of wormer that was used. So for the benzimidazoles or white wormers, you would leave 10 to 14 days between dosing and collecting the post-dose samples. For the levamazole, uh, levam, levam, uh, the yellow wormers, the interval would be seven to 10 days for the clear wormers of the first generation between 14 days and 17 days and for the second generation moxidectin then 17 to 21 days is recommended or if you're carrying out tests using two or more drugs in parallel then it's recommended you need 14 days between dosing and post-dose sampling now all these samples the pre-dose and the post-dose samples uh, should be chilled in a refrigerator to somewhere below 10 degrees, but not frozen, of course, and then submitted as quickly as possible to the laboratory uh, at Afby Stormont. In the laboratory, we'll carry out fecal egg counts and uh, the results will be reported to the veterinary surgeon uh, who's connected with that submission within about four days. If the post-dose fecal egg count is reduced by at least 95% compared to the pre-dose fecal egg count, then the antimintic is deemed to be working effectively. In some cases, for accuracy, we may ask that individual pre- and post-dose dung sampling from 10 animals might uh, be taken rather than the pool samples that I've described before. This, this gives an increased level of sensitivity to the test. So what can you do about antimintic resistance in your flock? Well, first of all, you should consider testing the flock routinely for the presence of antimintic resistance to the drug classes you use routinely on the farm, because you need to, to know if you have resistance to those drugs and if so, you need to slow down as far as possible the further evolution of antimintic resistance to those drugs that are still remaining effective on your farm. Only as a last resort should you convert to routine use of the newest class of the antimintic drugs, that's the orange wormers, as the efficacy of these compounds really does need to be preserved. And indeed, uh, you should be using these only uh, and for quarantine uh, treatment of bought in animals before you integrate them with the rest of the flock. 
Another important thing is to aim to change the class of antimintic drug you use regularly, say every year or two, and alternate between those that remain effective on your premises. That's alternate between the white, the yellow, the clear, uh, the first generation uh, clear drenches. Uh, uh, another important point is to carry out worming doses as infrequently as possible within the year. You should dose only those animals that are showing signs of significant worm infection based on a failure to gain weight or showing weight loss, possibly those that are showing severe scar, although this is not such an accurate indicator of worm infection. Best of all, uh, use fecal egg counting to determine which animals have got the significant worm burns and need to be treated. Having decided to dose particular animals, always weigh the animal and dose to the full amount recommended by the manufacturer. Always check the dosing gun for accuracy of delivery and check that the drug that you use is in date and has been properly stored. All of these things uh, can give false results uh, of antimintic resistance. So in the end, what resources are available to enable you to find out more about antimintic resistance and how you should go about tackling it? Well, the first port of call are, as your own veterinary practice, the, the vets uh, will have uh, information which is tailored to uh, be most useful in the local areas where their practice is situated. Then there are the Caffrey sheep advisors uh, will have uh, a wide knowledge of the applicability of these drugs across the province and can give uh, guidance in local, in local circumstances. Online, you can look up the SCOPES website. SCOPES uh, uh, provide an advisory guideline. SCOPES stands for the Sustainable Control of Parasites and Sheep, and they, and they update that website fairly regularly. So the information they give is, is relevant and uh, it's a good idea to keep an eye on what they're saying uh, as year by year goes past. Then you will probably want to submit dung samples to the parasitology section of veterinary science division at Stormont. And it's quite a good idea to go on their website uh, and find out the information that is there on antimintic resistance testings, testing in Northern Ireland. Uh, you can ring us up uh, or arrange for your vet to ring up the parasitology section to get particular advice on how you should go about sampling in your particular case. F folks, thank you very much. And Bob, thank you very much for, for that. Um, I'll say if there's any questions, uh, please put them through at the end. So uh, Bob, for now, thank you very much for your time. Thank you, Simon. So, Trevor, um, well, maybe if you're you're there, Trevor, I'm going to bring you back in. Yes. Yes. Good man. Good man. Yep. Right, yep. folks. Say with all these, with all our webinars, we obviously want to leave people with something to take home. Um, yes, there's. You know, this is only one aspect of some of the th within Trevor's farm and with all the other farmers' uh, enterprises. You know, whether it's grass, whether it's uh, your efficiency, whether it's a uh, warming or anim animal health issues, but as I say, for tonight we were we're concentrating on on the uh, warmer resistance issue with Trevor. So basically, what I will say and I'll reiterate, and I know I've said it several times, if there's problems, and I'm going to be bringing Trevor in here just to you know to finish up and go over some of this. But if you have suspicious that things aren't going right on your farm, write it down. Record it. Don't accept to say, oh, that's just the way it is. That's not good enough. And at the bottom line, that's going to affect your bottom line. And like we're in farming as a business, we're there to make money sustainably. Um, and, you know, you want to make sure that what you're, the effort you're putting into is, is rewarded. So in this particular case, if there is an issue, you know, speak to your vet specifically um, if you have a warming issue um, or perceived problem with it. And if you haven't already done so, I would strongly recommend an animal health plan. It's, it's a great tool and not something to be sitting on the shelf, but something to use and take action for where it's where it's is needed. Um, as Ruth has, has mentioned earlier uh, in the video, you know, fecal egg counts, no matter where you go through them, through your vet, through 
co-ops through wherever um you know do them and do them regularly you know don't just do them now and again um i appreciate it's a bit of work but uh, i can guarantee you it's, it's definitely worth it in the long run um and the other thing if possible which is is a big thing that bob has mentioned and trevor will hopefully will reiterate that shortly is that you know you want to keep your keep measuring your lambs keep weighing your lambs as much as possible um you know, it's not easy, but even if you only took a few lambs that were marked and brought them in regular or as, as regular as possible and, and monitor those lambs, they'll give you a representation of the flock, you know, something out there. So, Trevor, maybe you could maybe go for some of that there and then maybe finish off with the last wee bit. Yeah, well, just again to reiterate what Sen has said, if you have those suspicions, and I had them and I didn't record and investigate the, as soon as I should have done, and uh, that uh, would have cost me money in feeding extra meal to sheep and not getting lambs away when they, uh, as fat lambs, having to sell them as store lambs or more store lambs than they should have been selling. Uh, so again, it's uh, doing that uh, way in and doing the recording and uh, investigating that and uh, being, having your vet involved in doing that animal health plan and not only with the... Uh, the, the the warm burdens, but what whatever other uh, issues you have uh, to get your local vet on board and, and to, to talk through it and to put a plan in place uh doing the the, the fecal egg counts as i say there regularly and that you may find that you have less dosing to do uh which is saving you money on dosing and there's also less chance of bringing in that resistance because i know a friend of mine uh, he uh, has resistance to the, the three warmers, and in fact, he had used that new type warmer, the orange warmer, to uh, dose effectively. And uh, again, the bottom says weigh your lambs regularly, uh, and, and you will pick up uh, you will pick up a problem, and uh, it'll mean you're able to uh, sort it out. The sooner you get the problem, the sooner you can sort it out. And, and uh, as I say, you will save money by doing this, and 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 get your lambs away sooner hopefully and uh, at the very bottom just tested your worm is working and, and and don't assume it is uh, and that's what happened uh, in this situation and i assume that the, the warmer was working uh whilst it wasn't excellent trevor thank you very much i, I just want me point trevor I, I forgot to mention but while we were doing your the, the, the we trial trevor you actually had another batch of lambs that you those lambs actually you were considered probably a bit dirty um, if I'm right, um, or slightly yes. dirtier, and that's the ones you pulled out for that visual reason. However, you did pull out another batch, Trevor, of, of clean lambs, and maybe you could tell us what came out of that. That's right. The clean lambs were the second highest, had the second highest reading for worms, which I was very surprised at because that's what you would be previously would have, if you know before i started doing the uh taking the, the dung samples i would have been looking at the lambs and if you had dirty lambs you would be dosing them uh, but what i discovered with doing that trial is that the dirtiest lamb or the cleanest lambs actually had the highest the second highest reading for uh for the worm burden yeah uh, so which probably was the, the, the biggest surprise in in, in in doing that you know Exactly, Trevor, and that, if nothing else, folks, because it is, we know some farmers, that's to say, oh, that's a sure sign of worms. I think some work done uh, by colleagues in the South have found that, you know, there's no real correlation between dirty lambs and high hey, worms. Some have, some haven't. So, as I say, don't, uh, you know, don't assume that that's just because they've a dirty bag of hen that they have a high worm count, because it, it certainly isn't. But, as I say, just to finish off, folks, Test your warmers working. This anthemic resistance, warmer resistance is a big, big issue. And we certainly want to make sure that it's not something that's going to happen now, but we want to push it down the line. And thankfully, from our small trial with Trevor, he has given a few more options uh, with the warmers, which is uh, hopefully hope for, for other people. So I'll say, folks, if you have a, a concern, speak to your vet, get your fecal egg counts done. Um, if you haven't done them, and uh, you know if there is an issue, we'll hopefully push that resistance down the line. So, folks, Trevor, thank you very much. Folks, thank you very much for uh, uh, listening in. And I'll say if there's any questions, we're happy to take them. So back over to you, Graham. Uh, okay, Senan, uh, thank you very much. Uh, again, folks, thanks to everyone. Uh, they were all excellent presentations with uh, key take-home messages. Uh, certainly having the animal health plan, uh, in my opinion, is vital for everybody. And also, as Trevor said a, a number of times there, Never assume that your warmers are always working. 
Okay, so and that's one of the key take home messages tonight. But as a, as you've all been presenting there, uh, there's been a range of questions coming in. Uh, I'm just going to focus on the questions in relation to tonight's topic, if that's okay. Uh, and we'll spend maybe 10 or 15 minutes at the very most here going through them. So I have a number of questions for everybody. And again, apologies if I don't ask them. I'm only, I've only time to go through uh, a number of uh, the questions that I see on the screen there. So Trevor, uh, maybe just to start with yourself there, uh, just a practical question, leaving aside for weight gain uh, on your lambs, has there been other visible signs uh, that you have noticed that they haven't been performing the way they should? For example, maybe dry wool, or has there been anything else, Trevor, you've noticed? Yes, the dry wool would have been the main one, uh, along with them not uh, not performing on the weight. But yes, the dry wool and just didn't look as they should have. And yeah. certainly it didn't look as they're looking this year. Okay, yeah, no, and that, that's certainly uh, yeah. perfect. Yeah. Sorry, Trevor. Uh, yeah, I, I uh, that would have been the the, the main one, Graham. The the, uh, the dry wool and, and just didn't look as they said, didn't look as they uh, as they should have. And certainly, as I said, not looking as they do uh, this year. They're looking that uh, so much better. Yeah, uh, haven't got the proper treatment. Yeah. Okay, Trevor. Thank you very much. Just Trevor, when, when I have you on there, how long have you been using a clear drench? Given that you do not have resistance to any of the other three products. Uh, too long, uh, Graham. Uh, three, three to four years, possibly five years, which would not be good practice, as I can. Okay. Yeah. Uh, as I can see now, and as we've been told tonight. Yeah. Yeah. Oh no. Very, very much so. Uh, and I appreciate that, Trevor. And just Trevor, another wee question there. Uh, have you found that you've saved in the number of lamb warm treatments since you've started crying out the fecal egg counts with Ruth? Yes, I have. Uh, once we got that, uh, once we got that dosing correct, uh, yeah. we would be using less dosing. And okay. uh, as I said earlier, that's another big part of doing the dung samples that yeah. you're dosing hopefully less frequently and not creating uh -huh. that problem going forward. So yes, yeah. I would have noticed that, that I'm not using it as much. Yep. Yeah. Okay, Trevor. Thank you very much. Uh, Ruth, just on the uh, fecal uh, egg count, how often should these be carried out? Yep, apologies. I'm just not going to turn my video on in case I lose you here. And yep, fine. Her. But um, yep. yeah, it just it's it's dependent really. You know, as often as you as you can, two weeks usually, three you can stretch to. It's a wee bit weather dependent. You, we were, you know, that very dry spell this year. Anybody that was going every two weeks, we weren't seeing much of a change. You know, so yep. um, two to three weeks. Yeah, and thanks, Ruth. Are you seeing any improvement, Ruth, in the number of farmers crying out these tests? Or do a lot of farmers, in your opinion, still see it as an easier exercise just to treat their dose to sheep when they have them in the pen? I suppose, yes, That that's the real reason why we have these um, packs in the BDGs is that we can uh, demonstrate to the farmer the benefit of them. And once, you know, we start doing them regularly, then, you know, they're, they do become more interested in the result and then when we have meetings you know at Trevor's with our BDG group that that peer-to-peer -peer learning you know between farmers helps them take up an interest now there's no time you have to text to say well we do it again this week but you know it, it's getting them to to try it to see the benefit and then and then after that you know the phone calls start to roll in can we do it this week after that you know yeah yeah Yep, no, no, certainly, Ruth. And as you said earlier on, there are a number of different companies out there now who do have these uh, kits. Yeah. Uh, so there, there are options out there for everyone. Thanks yep. very much, Ruth. Uh, Siobhan, can you hear me okay there? Uh, yes, I can. Perfect, yes, Siobhan. Thank, thank you. Uh, I have a lot of questions for you here, Siobhan, but we'll we'll have to just limit the number I'm going to ask okay. you. So, uh, just there's a question came in there about Nemo. Uh, is there a problem at the minute? We did, you did, or Bob did mention there that it's no longer a spring issue. Uh, are you seeing a problem at the minute in the, through the labs or? Nematodirus. Yes, nematodirus. Yes, yeah. Uh, yeah. Um, we have seen a rise of an, a peak of it in the autumn, and okay. you can see the trends in that. Yeah, the, a small rise, but it certainly is there a peak in the autumn, and I think it's just down to the change in the well, environmental changes yeah that those risk factors for nematodirus are coming in in the in the autumn time you know uh -huh. Uh -huh. 
Um, I suppose you've got the environmental risk factors, but maybe also lambs that have been given repeatedly dosed over the spring and then into the summer and then potentially potentially haven't acquired their own natural immunity. Could yep. be still okay. naive to an yes. infection in the autumn time then. So that's yep. another one. Like, yeah, no, yeah, very much so, uh, Siobhan. Mm -hmm. and, uh, Siobhan, just a question there about why do you need to preserve susceptible worms? Okay, well, I suppose we're all farmers and the last thing we want to do is farm resistant worms. And that's what we've been doing really by repeatedly selecting out the resistant worms um, and not allowing the, they talk about this term in refugia that maybe some farmers are aware of, where you want to allow some susceptible worms to maintain, be maintained in the environment mm -hmm. so that it's, it's about targeting your selected treatment to targeting those animals that are that need to be wormed with yeah. your, your fecal egg counts. Yeah, yeah. If you continuously blanket to treat everything, all you're going to be left with is, as I said, you're farming resistant worms. So you need to allow to leave some susceptible worms for the environment. Yeah, yeah. yeah. No, very good, Siobhan. And it kind of leads me on to a question or a comment that came in. Uh, this person has asked, should they dose their ewes? They've read that not dosing ewes helps against anthelmintic resistance. So you've kind of touched on that, but just, yeah. just reiterate that again, Siobhan, just in relation to dosing ewes. All right, well, I suppose we're all aware, you know, your adult healthy yo should be able to withstand uh, uh, a parasitic challenge, you know, but we've learned previously and we've all been taught previously that you've got that um, uh, uh, yo's will immunity drops when they're lambing and, and when they're lactating and that they can put out a lot more eggs around that time and then they're on the ground for the spring lambs coming through. So we've always historically treated our yos when they're in when they're in for lambing or, or around the lambing time. But the problem is then if you treat them and treat them, the only thing that they're passing then on to the pasture for those spring lambs are your resistant worms. So the, the new thinking is worm them, yes, but maybe be more selective. And like you've mentioned before, you're selective, you're preserving susceptible worms. So yep. worm a proportion, leave a proportion of them not wormed. Uh, pick out, like we've talked about, weigh them, look at your body condition scores and pick out those yos that you think really will benefit from worming uh, the most uh, and maybe concentrate on them and leave some free then to pass susceptible worms onto the pasture. Yeah, and that goes back to what Trevor was saying, the importance of weighing and monitoring performance. Mm -hmm. That's where that gets yeah, into that. Yeah. You know, it's very yeah. important that, that we do yeah. that and link it back to your health plan. So, no, very, very, very good there, Siobhan. Siobhan, yeah. just a question here. What about the barber pole worm? Are you seeing much of this now in Northern Ireland? Well, um, we haven't seen much over in the West. I, I work out of the Omer lab and, and because of our wet conditions, we haven't seen it yet now yeah. in the PM room. We haven't seen it, but there has been a couple of cases in Stormont in the last number of years. So it, it is it is here and um, okay. certainly down in the south of the country as well. I've seen a lot more of it. It's definitely here. Um, this is Homunculus contortus. It's it's nasty. It causes can cause severe sudden deaths. It can hit very hard. Um, the other one thing you mentioned about dirty lambs, you won't get diarrhea with this worm. Okay. So that's something. So again, your fecal egg count, you might find you have a very high fecal egg count with uh, the barber pole because they can produce an awful lot of eggs very quickly. But thankfully, it's, it seems we don't have the conditions for it yet. You know, we don't have the, it prefers nice, dry, warm conditions. But it's coming and that's why I would be very keen to stress to people if you're buying in sheep to stress the importance of quarantine to keep it out. Yeah. Oh, yep, and yep. and treat and quarantine and treating yeah. effectively at the quarantine stage to keep it out. So don't bring it into your flock. Okay. Yep. Yep. Yeah, if you can. Yeah. Yep. No, very, very good. I appreciate that, uh, Siobhan. Right. A question here, and Darren, you may come in on this with Siobhan here. Uh has there been any work undertaken to establish finishing systems for lambs uh, on farms where there's no remaining effective anthelmintic doses that can be used? Yeah, uh, do you want to, Siobhan, or I, uh, I suppose I can make a comment first on the claim. Uh, right, fair enough. Yeah. Yeah. Does, 
I suppose has been work in other countries sort of has there hasn't really I suppose been a need to push it here yet but it's something that has to be done now and has to be looked at because in some say New Zealand or, or Australian uh, countries uh, you're you're probably looking at a situation where there's some let's say some farms where, where there's no wormer at all working even the new orange wormers and what they're looking at is using combinations of wormers now that's something you have to go down to or maybe assess with your vet or with, with a specialist but it's something that we will probably have to look at for farms that have say triple resistance and in the future unfortunately may have uh, resistance to the new the, the new strains as well mm-hmm. yeah i guess i suppose you will have that they talk about sheep sick soil and sheep sick sick ground and it may be a case of rotating you know like what what very drastic uh, steps like bob mentioned in his in his uh presentation where you have to maybe take sheep off ground for a, a while or leave ground bare of sheep do you think darren yeah uh, Those sort of drastic measures or yeah like like there is there is places in australia in particular where they've had to do that change in enterprise for a few years and like the problem with that is we don't actually know how long you'd have to leave them off because mm-hmm. there's no work that I suppose resistance is new and we can see how long parasites last in the in the soil last in the ground like it, it's it's a really tricky one and it, and it really I suppose reaffirms the importance of taking the steps to slow down antimintic resistance because look at it it's inevitable that there will be some development of resistance on some flocks if things are looked at right it's all about slowing it down and maintaining the efficacy of farmers for as long as possible okay yep okay folks no uh, thank you very much and siobhan just one last one for yourself there uh i have resistance identified to white yellow and clear doses or drenches to varying degrees do you have any options other than using zolvix uh as the, this person can't get another product and is there a risk of resistance developing to this one okay well i suppose it depends um you know it it depends when they say they've got varying degrees of resistance is has that been quantified for them or are they you say don't assume you don't have a problem but don't assume you do too because you're dosing and, and you've still got dirty lambs to check again like we said before go and do your fecal egg counts uh, and 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 get advice and get help. But if there is a quantifiable problem there, and the, the there is a obviously there has discovered a prop, a true resistance, um, not to panic uh, and not to reach for the the your orange and your purple drenches straight off. To consider rotating your warmers maybe over the year. You know your white drench might not work. Uh, in the autumn time, but it might work for them in the dyers in the spring and to change, swap them around and maybe then bring in your, your orange warmer then at the end of the year um, to, to to sort of finish them out, clear out any any resistant parasites that might be overwintered over the winter, you know, so people would do that. So changing things around a wee bit and get certainly get advice from your vet and from maybe the local advisors uh but not to not to panic and just say all right i'm not using one the the first the the your white and your clear and your yellow drenches at all and and go straight for the orange drench and, and never never use anything else since you know that would be the very yeah. worst thing to do yeah no certainly would be you know yeah no uh <laughs> sorry Siobhan. yeah that would you really would be going down a rabbit hole then if you'd be stuck you know yeah um Anybody else that want to add on that? Sorry, Darren, you're on mute there, maybe. Oh, yeah. Sorry. Yeah, I think it's something we touched on. I suppose Graham is say that there is say even Siobhan touched on it there. Like there there be warmers that will work at different times of the years and maybe combining warmers. But that's that's to say you need to have more specific information about exactly what is the level of resistance to that product and yep. say the time of year where your main threat is. Yep, yep, perfect, Darren. Uh, Darren, just when, when you're on there, in your opinion, what's the likelihood of more new warmers uh, coming onto the market given Zolvix and StarTech are relatively new? That's the way. Uh, I, su- 
I suppose, look at Scream, if we look at the, the COVID at the moment and look at the vaccine and the millions of euros that were thrown to it and how long yeah. it took to develop that. Yeah, fair like, enough. Uh, the the sheep business worldwide, there's no one beating down the doors to develop new products on leukocytes, on wormers, on other vaccines. Uh, and like we see that it is big business in Australia and New Zealand, there is being work done, but it's yeah. so difficult, I suppose, to get a product. So I, yeah. I wouldn't have huge optimism. I think that, yes, there will is at a stage, but I think it's going to be a long burner. Like, like we're lucky to see two new products in the last 10 years, 12 years. It was yeah. 40 years before that, before we'd entered. Yeah. No, perfect, Darren. And folks, I'm conscious of time. I'm just going to ask you one more question here, Darren, and then uh, sadly we'll have to wrap up. Uh, and again, if anybody has any other questions, they can email us directly with them and we will get back to them. But one question here, uh, Darren, is it likely that there could be restrictions on products farmers can buy in the future if resistance and issues continue to uh, develop? Yeah, I'd say that could be coming. I'd say that could be coming from a southern uh, viewer. Yes, uh, we we will have different restrictions, so we will from from January, uh, Graham, because okay. we yeah. we went down a different avenue in the in the north. You have socially socially qualified personnel who can continue, say, to uh, sell it, but it, there will be significant restrictions in the south. And I think, look, it's only a matter of time if we don't uh, say have improvement around. Uh, medicine usage, just you could see more restrictions everywhere. But uh, for the moment, yes, there is definitely coming in the south from, from January. Yeah. Okay, Darren. Thank you very much, folks. That's all we're going to have time for. But just to conclude tonight, uh, you know, I hope you found it informative. I certainly did. If you are a business development group member and have any further questions, please contact your local uh, Calfrey advisor. Uh, if you have any relation, any questions in relation to the Northern Ireland Sheep Program, as I said before, either contact myself for Senan or Darn, and or Cairn. You can also find out more about the program uh, on the Caffrey website and also on the Caffrey Facebook page, and also on the IFJ uh, Northern Ireland Sheep Program page. And that them pages are all updated. And again, all tonight's recordings can also be uh, watched on the Caffrey uh, YouTube page. Uh, please note that we are planning a, another WebEx event uh, in October. Uh, we will be sending out further details in relation to that in due course. Uh, so again, we will keep you posted. But finally, I want to thank everybody uh, for uh, all your work. There's a lot of work goes into preparing these events and making recordings and this and that. So thank you to each and every one of you for all the work you've put into this. Uh, and preparing and delivering tonight. Thank you very much, folks, and uh, good evening to everybody. Thank you.